All right, so good morning. This is the day two of our guide conference and presenting is Dr. Sonny Kelly, who is the instructor at Fayetteville Technical Community College. And the session he is presenting is the Personally Connected Pedagogy Workshop for Teachers, Trainers, and Leaders. Welcome, Dr. Kelly. Thank you very much, Barbara. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here with you all. And today you all have been admitted into the Institute for Personally Connected Practices, uh, or in our case, Personally Connected Pedagogy. I'm really excited about the smaller group we have today because I get a chance to say your names and to connect with you all. Uh, I don't know if you all remember that old uh, Destiny Child song. Anybody singing it in their head? Say my name, say my name. You got to find ways to connect to rhythms. We're going to talk about it today. We've got to find ways to connect to the rhythms of our lives because my rhythm, when it marries and connects and coalesces with your rhythm, becomes our rhythm. And that's what we want to do in our classrooms and in our respective learning spaces is to create rhythms of personal connection. So today we're going to continue in this spirit of talking about equity, inclusion, and diversity. I know I said those out of order. I'm sorry. We all understand it's DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? I, I, I want to honor that, that rhythm because when we learn rhythms and we stick with rhythms, we can better connect to one another. That's one of my key lessons today. So in this institute, I, I want to challenge you all to set up simple, consistent, repeatable rhythms with yourselves, with your loved ones, with your students in your classrooms so that we can be better personally connected. In this conference, we've been learning about how to uh, celebrate diversity, how to work toward equity, and how to embrace and build community through inclusion. And this institute is an extension of that. And I'm gonna give you some practical tips. And I'm gonna ask you, the experts in this room, they're about, uh, looks like they're about uh, 10 uh, other experts in this room to share your input as well. I see Jillian and Monica and Shauna, Deborah, uh, I see Jennifer, I see Christina, and you all may have titles. We're not going to worry about titles today. I'm just Sunny. Don't call me Dr. Kelly. I put it in the thing just because it's official. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm a fresh doctor, so I'm always excited to use a title. But today, please call me Sunny. I see uh, there are two Jennifers. There's a Jen and a Jennifer. Uh, there's a Christina as well. And so glad that you all are with us. And so one thing that we have to be wary of and careful of in this time of political strife racial division, gender and sexual marginalization, is that we don't call each other out as much as we call each other in. Now, there are always those bad actors who need to be called out and corrected. What I have found, however, is that more often than not in my classroom and in my learning spaces, if I can use some of these personally connected practices of pedagogy, I can tend to call more people in than I call people out and I can draw them into personal connection. In other words, I don't want people to come into my classroom or to leave my classroom so bent on being politically correct that they're no earthly good. In other words, so careful about what they say and how they say it that they can't be honest and clear and learn. See, if, if you're so careful, I can't tell what ignorance you, you, you have. And ignorance is not a bad thing. Ignorance is an opportunity for us as teachers, right? But I can't tell what you don't know if you're not willing to raise your hand and share but if you're afraid of being popularly canceled because you're not politically correct, then we can never get to the root of the issue, right? So I wanna get away from being politi politically correct where we're trying to control the language in the classroom. I also don't wanna to get to a place where students or myself, where we feel like it's comfortable to just shut down any perspective in the classroom by popularly canceling it. Now, it helps that I teach communication. So my job is to build bridges with words and with nonverbal communication as well. So the last thing I want people to do is to stop communicating or stop sharing their words uh, in my classroom. So instead of being politically correct or popularly canceled, I want to move us to a place where we are personally connected, a place where we admit our ignorance, we celebrate the possibilities of learning. We celebrate the expert knowledge in the room. We celebrate each other's perspectives in such a way that we desire the best for the others. And there's a Greek word, agape. We have a, a deeper level of love and appreciation for the other person because I'm personally connected to them. I'm not respecting them and honoring them because I have to, or because the instructor said I had to, or because that's just the right thing to do, but because I care about them. I follow what we call the platinum rule. Right. Has anybody heard of the platinum rule? Show of hands. Anybody heard of that? My wife teaches resilience and sexual assault victim advocacy for the Air Force. She taught me this platinum rule that blew my mind. 
somebody tell me the golden rule. And by the way, there are, there are 10 of us. So you can mic off and let's talk. And if you want a camera up, I'm down with that too. I'm going to meet you where you are. One thing we said before we, the recording is uh, a friend of mine, a mentor of mine, True Pettigrew, he taught me this. He taught me that if I'm willing to meet people where they are, not where, they, where I want them to be. In other words, meet people where they are, not where I want them to be. And if I'm willing to love them for whom they are, not who I want them to be, then and only then can I lead them where they need to go, really where we need to go. So today I'm going to lead you all and I'm going to be led in some ways in this process of personal connection. I'm a, a devout follower of uh, Paulo Freire's work, The uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. I see myself as a teacher and a learner. So I'm going to ask every, everyone to please, if you're available or able or interested, turn your camera on. And if you have something to say, put it in the chat, sure. But even better, let's hear your voice because your voice matters. And this is how I want to lead my classrooms. I want my students to know that their voices matter. We are not in the business of giving voice. They show up with voices. We are in the business of lifting voice. So who knows the golden rule? Very low stakes answer. Anybody chime in, what does the golden rule mean to you? Hey, Jen, good to see you. <laughs> Someone share with me in your own words that when you hear the golden rule, what does that mean to you? I guess I'll go. Um, treat others the way you want to be treated. Treat others the way you want to be treated. Or the to use the King James Version from the Bible, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But that golden rule is reiterated and it reverberates through multiple cultures and religious backgrounds, right? Treat others the way you want to be treated. The platinum rule, as my wife taught me, and I want us to try to embrace this, is to treat others the way they want to be treated. If I'm a vegan and you love meat, to, my golden rule would be to always give you delicious vegan meals, but you're not gonna be satisfied because you're a carnivore. So treat others the way they want to be treated. Now, this is assuming that they don't want to be treated in a way that's abusive or unhealthy. I, that's certainly not what we're doing here. Everything in moderation and with love in mind, right? So treating other people the way they want to be treated helps us to be more personally connected. So I know that when I start a class, the last thing I want to do is sit there and be told about all the stuff that you are requiring of me and read a whole bunch of stuff on a syllabus or on your ground rules about how you are going to be disappointed in me or give me an F if I don't succeed. What I want to do is come into a community, a place where I belong, a place where I can mess up and it's going to be okay, a place where I can be brave. Question for you all. Can you see my face right now? I know the slides are up, but I want to make sure you can. Okay, thank you, Jen. It's nonverbals are powerful. Thank you. Um, thank you for the thumbs up as well. And so I want to make sure you can see my face because one thing that I always do in classrooms is I try to open up with a little bit of poetry. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, redundancy is crucial, right? We need to find ways, as we've learned yesterday, I loved all of the, the great wisdom and knowledge that came across yesterday. If you missed yesterday, make sure you check out the recordings. We need to find ways to give students entryways back into the flow of the classroom. They may have zoned out. There may be some emotional, some physical, some, uh, some other psychological noise that's happening. You got to give them access to come right back into the rhythm and catch up with you so they don't feel like they're lost and they're behind, right? So one way to do that is to build simple, consistent, repeatable rhythms. Simple, consistent, repeatable rhythms in everything we do. And as an actor and as a poet, of course, I'm adept at that, but no one in this room has to be considered an actor or a poet to operate in these simple, consistent, repeatable rhythms to build uh, connected practices. If you haven't noticed, I have a bit of a speech impediment. I talk faster than I can think. Jim's like, no, you, you're doing well. You speak so well. Yes, but I, I go fast. I'm from California, Southern California. We go fast. We drive fast. We live fast. And so I have to remind myself Sonny, everybody's not always with you because you're going so fast. You sometimes forget what you just said. So what I do is I create these elements of redundancy that allow myself to be anchored and allow my students to always be anchored and gives them some sense of power and connection to, excuse me, to the rhythm. I believe it was the great prophet Lil Wayne who said, repetition, repetition, repetition is the father of all learning. Now, uh, Barbara told you all earlier, I am a youth pastor, so Lil Wayne is not the, the type of music that I go around listening to. But I do glean wisdom and knowledge wherever I can because it's everywhere. And Lil Wayne is a lyrical genius, a business uh, master. And when he said that on a documentary, I locked that in because I knew that the name Lil Wayne is a rhythm. 
that young people can connect to. I also knew that those were just words of wisdom that, that anybody should be able to connect to. So repetition, repetition, repetition is the father of all learning. You can quote Lil Wayne in that and maybe get a little street credit. I have to go more modern now and, call, and quote somebody else. Um, I was gonna say the baby, but the baby's been in some trouble. So maybe not that um, Drake or somebody else uh, as we go forward, Billie Eilish. So what I have found is that if I can bring in these rhythms, then my students can stay with me. So today I wanna to empower you all. I wanna enrich you. And I want us to see if we can share some tips on how we're building up simple, consistent, repeatable rhythms in our classrooms, okay? So I oftentimes start my classes and my sessions with a poem because it gives my students permission to play with words and language. It primes the pump. It lets them know that I'm going to lead by example and put skin in the game. Uh, I'm not gonna hold back. I'm gonna allow the power of poesia, the Greek word poesia meaning creation or to create. I'm gonna allow that to move through my body and I'm going to share that openly, vulnerably, and hopefully with my students, hoping that they'll join me in this, this game of playing and learning. Fifth letter of the alphabet, quickly, somebody type it into the chat. I love it. I saw Jim, Jim was looking up, trying to find, trying, going by memory. Um, some of y'all may be doing this. Fifth letter of the alphabet, anybody? That's a problem sharing here. Somebody has, somebody tell me, cause I, I can't see the chat here as I. Uh... E. E, thank you, Jen. How did you know the fifth letter of the alphabet is E? Are you a genius? Did you come in here already knowing and memorizing the, the numerical designation for every letter? No. Which I would not put past you. Some people have done that. No, how did you figure it out? By going through the repetition that we learned as children. Yeah. And I will, I will guarantee that most of you, because I did this and most people I do this with do this, if you're being honest, you sang a song to the melody of Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. Twinkle, A, B, C, D, E. And you found it just like that because that little girl inside of you, that little boy, that child inside of you learned to use their body, their face, the colors, the decorations in the classroom, their voice to learn simple, consistent, repeatable rhythms that are with you forever. You can go through dementia, you can have traumatic brain injury, and most of us will still be able to sing the ABC song because some teacher allowed you to play and use your body and poetry to learn something. If I were to ask you where your head, shoulders, knees, and toes were, there's a whole song to that, right? Head, shoulders, knees, and toes, knees, and toes. Hey, head, shoulders, knees, and toes, knees, and toes, right? We, we, we've learned so much interdisciplinary approach. Thank you. I found my chat, y'all. I can see it now. I see all the, all the participation. E, e, e. Yes, yes, yes. I love it. I love it. Uh, and just checking in with Jennifer. So don't, don't worry about being late. I will take you how I can get you. And please tell your students that. That's part of the rhythm of welcoming that we put into the classroom. People are late for many different reasons. Ours is not to ask why. Ours is to be grateful for their presence because we need them in the classroom. Sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name. Come on, 80s babies. And they're always glad you came. Boom, boom, boom. You want to be where people see. Uh, your troubles are all the same. You want to go where everybody knows. Sing with me. Your name. Sustain. All right. So. There's a reason, y'all. You know I'm kooky, I'm silly, I'm corny. I know. But there's a reason why I bring these songs and I let them to flow through my body because they allow you to connect to some maybe some fond memories, to some tunes, some things that you can use as mnemonic devices. Your students can use this stuff as mnemonic devices. The thing is, when we were little kids at five and six and we were allowed to jump up and sing A, B, C, D, or Y, M, C, A, we were allowed to learn in that way. Then about third grade, they said, hey, standardized tests. Sit down, shut up, memorize. Then they said, you read faster, you're in the fast group. You can't figure out the formula or the math, you're in the slow group. The kids who were able to memorize, think quickly, and to please the teacher did well. The other ones, even if we didn't say they weren't worth our time, we showed them by cutting our eyes, not spending time, lowering our expectations, taking on what Carol Dweck would call a fixed mindset. I say all of this to say, there's a method to my madness simple, consistent, repeatable rhythms, 
in every aspect of your teaching will facilitate personal connection. It will give students permission to mess up and to learn, and they need permission for both. Some of our best lessons have been learned in failure or what I call falling forward. So here's a poem that I share with my students on the first day of every class, no matter what class I'm teaching, because I want them to know that their presence matters. And like I said to you, Jennifer, I'll take you how I can get you. I'm not, I don't want to know why you relate. I want to know that you're here and I'm grateful. And I want you to know that I need you in this room. Your, your, your expert knowledge, your energy is appreciated. So when a student comes to me and says, you know what, I'm sorry I'm late. I say, you know what, I accept your apology because that's a valid apology. And I missed you when you weren't here. Let's be real. I'm not going to blow it off. I'm like, oh, no, you're fine. No, I, I accept your apology. I did miss you. Thank you for acknowledging that, that I missed you because I needed you. That requires some vulnerability, doesn't it? And I'll take you how I can get you. Come on in. Have a seat or stand up if you like. Let's learn together. All right. So here's a poem that I'm going to share with you all to get us started. Six humans trapped by happenstance in bleak and bitter cold. Each possessed a stick of wood, or so the story's told. The fire dying in need of logs, the first one held his back. For of the faces round the fire, he noticed one was black. The next man looking across the way saw one not from his church and couldn't bring himself to give the fire his stick of birch. Poor man sat in tattered clothing. Dave is cold a hitch. Why should his log be put to use to warm the idle rich? The rich man sat back and thought of all the wealth he had in store and how to keep what he had earned from the lazy, shiftless poor. The black man's face bespoke revenge as the fire passed from his sight. See, all he saw in his stick of wood was a chance to spite the white. The next man of this forlorn group gave not except for gain, hmm? giving only to those who gave was how he played the game. Each log was held in death still hands as proof of human sin. They didn't die from the cold without. They died from the cold within. And because I honor patterns and simple, consistent, repeatable rhythms, before I say anything else, I'm going to type in the title of that poem and its author because everybody asks me that every time I do it. So here it comes. James, thank you, Jennifer. I received the applause, Patrick. And please do feel free to applaud, not because it builds my ego and feeds, feeds my ego and affirms me, which it does. It does. I welcome it. Fair catch. To use a football term, I will catch it. But especially because we need to have these places of metabolization. Uh, Resma Menachem wrote a book called My Grandmother's Hands. If you haven't read it, read it all, oh, how to connect to people uh, through trauma. And what he talks about is the fact that we all physically need to metabolize how we learn, how we experience, et cetera. And so after at a performance or after something happens that's different, that, that is a break in the rhythm, to clap or to snap, or like, oh, that's okay. Because what it is, is it, it's, it's, it, it meets a social expectation, but also a social need that you know after a fight, we need to make up. After performance, we need to applaud. Uh, after, after someone compliments us, we need to say, oh, thank you. Like that's, it's, it's a need that's inside of us. It's part of human connection, right? So let me put that in. Thank you, Jen. Yes. Okay. The cold within. And Jen, you have already learned one of my most important rhythms. Dr. Kelly has fun. He goes hard. He goes fast. He knows he has 90 minutes and it will go by like that, y'all. This is going to be the quickest, quickest session you ever had because I'm going to give you all kinds of love and energy. You're not going to know what to do with yourselves. And because I do that, I get lost. I'm the, 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 uh, I'm the uh, absent-minded professor. Always present, absent-minded professor. So I need students to help me to remind me, hey, make sure you type in the name of that author. Make sure you type in that, right? Go ahead. Talk to me, Jen. I, I can hear you typing, but it's it's not showing up in the chat. It didn't show up. You know what? I may have sent it to somebody directly because oh. that's what happened. Oh, Shauna. Thanks, Shauna. Did, Sha did I send it to you, Shauna? How did that happen? I don't know how I this did Shauna share it with everyone? Oh no, she shared no, with my I was my trying to put in I was trying to put in the book link for um my grandmother's hands, but it's like a super long link. So I apologize. Oh. So Shauna, are <laughs> you and my grandmother's hands sure. fan? You have a hands well, fan? no, I was just, I was putting it in there for all of us. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Listen, so did you see that now, Jen? The Cold Within by James Patrick Kenny? 
What What's the author of the poem? Uh, James Patrick Kinney. Okay. And the book is, and I'll just type in the title of the book, My Grandmother's Hands by Resma Menachem. And I may have spelled that name wrong. Um, I'm going to admit Lay, Lee. Come on in. Is it Lee? Come on in, my friend. So what, I, what you all have just modeled for me, Jen and Shauna, respectively, is the fact that this rhythm in the classroom is not mine. I do not get to own it. It is our rhythm. It is our rhythm. So I set an expectation. I said, hey, y'all, what happens after this presentation are two things. People want to clap and people want to get the name of the author and the name of that poem. And I went into a, the clap and, and then I jumped on Resma Menachem because it's such a wonderful connection about how you metabolize things. And I lost my way, but not my presence with you all, not my desire to teach. But because I've already shared my, uh, my connectivity with you all, personal connection, Jen already knew she had permission to jump in and say, hey, don't forget to give us the name and the poem. And that put me right back on track because I need you too. I need you and you need me. This is the, back to Paolo Freire. Right. If you haven't, and most of us as educators have, but if you haven't read Paolo Freire's uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, please do, because that, that book reframes the way in which we see teaching in the classroom. If teaching is not personally connected in such a way that you as a teacher understand that you are a learner and a teacher simultaneously throughout the session, if you're not doing it that way, you're not doing it the right way, the most effective way, the most equitable and inclusive way, right? Because he talks about a traditional way of teaching as a banking method. The teacher comes in, usually in a body that is privileged. We saw yesterday in that presentation about the bodies that are privileged, slender, uh, sound, or we'll say uh, a, a neuronormative, uh, 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 usually white or maybe European features, right? I, 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 it's, it, it's not lost on me about the fact that because I speak so clearly and because my skin is not dark, dark as some and my features have some European elements to them and I am slim and I am tall, these are things, these are privileges that have given me some uh, space. I, I take up space. I come on strong and I'm allowed to. I'm a man. I'm a cis heterosexual man in this society. There's a lot of space I'm allowed to take up that I have not earned, right? But Paolo Freire, Freire humbles me in the pedagogy of the oppressed. He says, you sit down, you shut up and you listen, you shut up and you listen to your students. And when you talk, it's always informed by and in conversation with what they need while also vulnerably admitting what you need, right? And that's a, that's a, it's a constant dance. It's like a poem. So when we talk about how we're gonna to connect to each other and what I mean when I say I want to empower, enrich, and also be enriched by you all today. Um, I'm coming down to the heart of the matter. And that is this, nobody cares how much you know till they know how much you care. <laughs> Your students may have the utmost respect for you, but if they are worried about you judging them or whether or not you believe in them, it's gonna be a great hindrance to their learning. They've got to know that you care about them first and foremost, that you love them. My students on a regular basis tell me that I'm corny my students laugh at me. I, I can tell they're not laughing with me sometimes. I know it, but I love it because they're allowing me to model what it is to humbly admit your ignorance and to learn and to get better and to grow in a community where you are loved and you are welcome in all of your corniness. And I tell them, I say, you know what? I know I'm corny and you can call me candy corn because that corn is wrapped in love. I loved you all before you got here. I've been thinking about you all, praying about you all before the semester started. I love you and there's nothing you can do about it, which means there's, there's going to be no offense in this classroom that I can't get over and still love you through. I may have to send you out of the classroom. We may have to have some repercussions and some, some protocols followed if you don't follow our standards, but I will never, never withhold my love from you. And that gives students permission to learn boldly and bravely. I know it sounds uh, maybe even cliche, but it sounds almost... Uh, rose colored glasses, too optimistic, but y'all, I've been doing this for decades and it always works. And I've had people say, well, you're just too nice. You're going to, no, I give Fs, I give Ds, I, I withdraw students. I'm fair and I love them. I just do. I don't just love the job. See, some of us love the job or the concept of, oh, I'm, an, I'm a harbinger of knowledge and I share. And I, I love the students. I tell them on day one, after I share that poem, that poem tells me that everyone in this room has a little stick of birch that they can put into a fire that we all need for warmth. And I need you all, y'all. I need you to share your sticks of birch. 
I need you to raise your hands and participate. Not only because all of us learn, but guess what? When you do the reading and you participate and you show up, it makes me feel loved. It makes me feel like, I'm gonna be honest, it makes me feel like you respect me. When you don't show up to class and you don't read, I take it personally because I take your education personally, because I take you personally, because I wanna be personally connected. And if you're too busy trying to protect yourself and your heart, your tender, your tender feelings from your students, that defense mechanism is gonna create what Resma Manakin calls dirty pain. We can go through life and we will all have pain. We can choose dirty pain, which is where you save face. You always come out the winner. You, you cover your tailpipe. You can make sure that you, know, you don't get in trouble with the administration. Uh, you don't ever deal with the deep issues because they, they hurt too much to deal with. And dirty pain doesn't go away. The repercussions of dirty pain can be everlasting. But then there's clean pain. You have the tough conversations. You admit your ignorance. As we learned in our conversation about microaggressions yesterday, you admit that you may have hurt someone. You may have invalidated them or aggressed or, 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 or assaulted them. And you stop and say, I did not want to do that. I apologize, please forgive me. And you, put, you humble yourself and you put your heart in their hands knowing that they could crush it. They could look at you and say, I don't accept your apology. You're the worst teacher I've ever had. You suck. You're a Karen. You're an angry black woman. You're a whatever it may be. And I can speak just because I can, I, I, I can see some of the genders and pictures in this classroom. I know some of the labels people have put on you. I don't want to be the thug, the angry black man, right? We're all, we all are trying to avoid and run away from these labels people put on us. But when we come into a loving environment that's personally connected, we know people care about us. We're open and we're ready to learn because we know we live beyond that label. We're seen by our instructor and our peers as more than that label, right? So how do we do that? Let's get into it. I want you to write this down if you haven't already. I am all about connecting to my students at all levels. Uh, I am a kinesthetic learner. And if it were up to me, I would have no slides. So the slides are here for all of you visual learners. Any visual learners in the house, would you put your hand up or give a shout out? Like I learned, thank you, Jen. Jen, that makes sense. You put your camera up. You're like, I see you, you see me. I love it. All right, so Monica, yes, visual learner as well. Monica, I also noticed you changed, you changed the tone of your thumbs up. I see you, uh, tonally correct. I haven't learned how to change my, <laughs> thanks. Humor, humor y'all, it's medicine, right? It's crucial. And you know what humor is too? Humor is a rhythm that requires participation. Because if I drop a, a punchline and you don't laugh, I realize I need to adjust. Your laughter is your response. It's not just approval. It's your way of helping me to metabolize and helping us to understand what just happened. And sometimes we laugh to keep from crying, right? If I say knock, knock, and you don't say who's there, I got nothing. I need you. I need you, right? So the fact that throughout the class, I'm noticing things and I'm seeing things. I'm never calling you out. I'm calling you in to say, you matter enough for me to pay attention to that. I noticed that. Very cool. And I noticed that, especially Monica, because I still haven't learned. Whenever I jump into a Zoom, I jump in quickly. And by the time I'm in, I don't have time to figure out my tones. So I haven't learned how to do it quickly. I'm sure I can figure it out. But I'm inspired because you, you, you did that in the, in the midst of the, of the flow. Uh, so I have at least two visual learners. So these slides are for you. I'm meeting you where you are. They're not in my comfort zone. I, I teach my students all the time in my public speaking class. Death by PowerPoint is one of the most painful, slow deaths you could ever experience, right? Uh, which is why I just put a few words on here for you to lock them in for your notes. I also know I go fast, but I try to use some inflection, some drama, some poetry. So my auditory learners, where are my auditory learners at? That's a little shout out to DMX in a strange non-rhythmic way. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Shauna. I see you, Shauna. I mean, I hear you, Shauna. I hear you. Let me speak your language. All right, Jillian. Yes, yes, auditory. Okay. So you are probably enjoying the pops of the language. I naturally use alliteration and rhyme on a regular basis. I've been doing this for so long and allowing myself to be a conduit for poetry for so long. I don't even try. Like many of my lectures just sound like spoken word because I'm always playing with words. And sometimes it lands and sometimes it doesn't. It doesn't, doesn't really matter. The fact is that I'm playing and I'm giving you and me permission to play. That's where we learn the best in play, right? Uh, to go from Paulo Freire, let me just buck, jump into uh, Augusto Boal. Yeah, if you haven't studied a little bit of Augusto Boal, I'm going to put that in the chat. Augusto Boal was a student of Paulo Freire and he studied theater as well as the pedagogy of the oppressed. Augusto Boal. He wrote a book called The Theater, Theater of the Oppressed or Poetics of the Oppressed. It's, 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 it's not a long read, but it is, he gets into some, some 
theory and, and, and some existentialism. But the, the most important point is when he says, when you allow people to play and work with drama and poetry, it just lets, it helps them learn better. And it helps us all to humble ourselves and to really deal with each other and build community better. So I want you to notice that even down to, oh, and my kinesthetic learners, all of you all, I want you to move around a little bit. I hope that you're singing the songs. When I sing a song, jump in. When I say, sometimes you want to go, I hope you're throwing your head back and say, well, everybody knows your name. Doom, doom, doom. That's the kind of stuff that helps you to learn, helps your students to learn. If your students in the back of the class doing the running, running man and he's learning, let them do that thing. As long as everybody's not stopping the class to pay attention to him, it's not about him, it's about us learning with these rhythms, right? My rhythm plus your rhythm equals our rhythm. Interdisciplinary, I just went mathematical on you. See that stem? Ah, see? I, you feel me, Jen? All right, so speaking of mathematical, simple, consistent, repeatable rhythms. I even say those terms on purpose because simple is two syllables. Simple, consistent, repeatable. I go from a two to a three to a four on purpose. Aha, uh -huh, you see what I did there? Aha! Uh -huh. And I did that on purpose because not only is it mnemonic for me, so I could remember this. Now, I've been teaching this for a long time now, so I've got it. But at first, I wanted to remember it. But also, it's mnemonic for you because I want you to remember. First step in Bloom's taxonomy is for you to remember, right? Or actually, to understand, then remember, right? So hopefully, you're understanding as I explain it. And so I want you to remember, right? And it just continues that flow of a rhythm because rhythms operate, uh, relationships operate through rhythms, right? So oop, for all my visual learners in the house, what is in a name? Has anybody read Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People? If you haven't, I totally understand. It seems like a really cheesy salesperson's book. And salespeople do read it and they do well when they do. I, when I was taking persuasion in my master's degree program at St. Mary's University in San Antonio, Texas, my instructor made us read this and I read it under duress. I was like, come on in, Megan Herbeck. Um, I read it under duress. I did not want to read it. It just sounded like it was beneath me. Sam, welcome, Megan. One of the best things I've ever done was read this book because this book is not about just influencing people for the sake of influencing them or making the sell. It's about connecting to people. And the first rhythm that anybody ever really consistently understands in their life is their name, which is one reason why I keep saying your names, to remind you that you matter. A person's name is to him or her the sweetest and most important sound in, in any language. And I have found that to be consistently true. Now, you've got to say the name right. You've got to call them what they want to be called. One thing I found with my students is I always ask them what their name is. I oftentimes will say, what's your government name, right? Because I want to make sure I say that correctly. And I will practice and practice until I get that right. I don't care how difficult it is. If it's Hmong, if it's uh, Laotian, if it is uh, Chinese, I'm going to practice and work. If it's, if it's Kiswahili, if it's something your mama made up, Darsha Kwane or whatever, I'm going to get that right. Because for me, Lee, I'm going to ask you to mute for me, my friend. I can hear you a little bit. What I found is for me, that if I can say your name right, I'm showing you that I honor you. And that first most important rhythm of your life, your name, it matters to me too. That means you matter to me, right? Because people are always wondering, how do I let my students know I care? I, I mean, I'm crying, I'm working, I'm spending the hours. A simple way is learn their name and say it right. Then ask them, what would you like me to call you in class? Along with their pronouns. What are the pronouns that are best when I refer to you? Don't say what pronouns do you prefer? And, and I've learned this because when you say what pronouns do you prefer, it makes it appear that their sense of self is arbitrary or about their preference or about, you know, it could change tomorrow. And we know it could change, but it, it's, we want to honor the fact that right now you consider yourself a, to be they or to be he or to she, whatever it may be. And that's who you are. And that's who, that's how I'm going to deal with you. I'm going to meet you where you are, right? Not where I want you to be or think you should be. I'm going to love you for whom you are, not who I think you should be so I can lead you where we need to go. So I always ask, what are your pronouns? Or I even say this, because pronouns has become a trigger word for some people nowadays, especially on the political right. I say, hey, if I were referring to you and I weren't gonna use your name, but I was gonna talk to you about somebody else because you're such a great student, would I, would I say he, she, they, them? What, would I, what, what words would I use? Oh, okay. That, and then I'm right on track. Also, some folks aren't comfortable with the term pronoun because they never fully understood what it meant. And so now you might embarrass them in front of class when you say, what are your pronouns? They're the first person. You're like, uh, what's the pronoun? 
Now we have everybody pausing, like, you don't know what a pronoun is. Now you've just outed someone, right? You just called them out. So instead, I just explain what a pronoun is. I may not even use that term. And I say, what should I best, what can I refer to you to let you know I care about you? That's what I want to know. That's the bottom line, right? So I want to know your name. I want to know the pronouns that are best for you, for me to connect with you. And one thing I love to do is also ask them what the root of their name is, what their, the meaning of their name is, right? And when you do that, it lets them figure out a connection to purpose through their name, through that rhythm, and then you can call on it throughout the, the, the class, right? So I know the name Jennifer means white wave because I've had a couple of Jennifers in my class, or white wave, right? And so for Jennifer, if she were to remind me of something I'm like, Jennifer, like that white wave just washing over. I, I brought all this confusion, you just wash it on over. Thank you for reminding me to give you the name of that poem. Yes, right? Deborah means bee. And I think about a hard worker, someone who's who's creating honey, you know? Um, so I, I might say, Deborah, man, that was a sweet, sweet point you just made right there. Sweet like the honey from the honeycomb who makes so honeycomb, the B, I see you, Debbie Deb, or whatever we called you, you know, agreed to call you in the class, right? And throughout the class, y'all, it's like, because you've opened yourself up to this, you're making all these connections to the, to the students, and you become like the famous African uh, 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 storyteller, Anansi, the little spider, you're casting webs. And as you cast those webs, these students are learning in a way that is not only safe, because what does a web do? A web catches you when you fall down from high heights, but also it connects you to concepts you didn't know before. So it's a web that networks you and creates kind of a nook or a nest. And it's, remember I told you I use, I use alliteration all the time. I've never said that before, but because you all are my muses and, I, and they were doing this together. I love this fact that as a Nancy, and I'm using a Nancy because I wanna be relevant, right? We all know Shakespeare and most of us know Aesop's fables. And some people don't know a Nancy, a West African tradition. It's a story, uh, a Nancy is a character in many West African stories and he is a spider and he's clever. Sometimes a good guy, sometimes the bad guy. But what, I'm, what I wanna to connect to is our, our mutual heritage and uh, the richness of storytelling in the African tradition, which is oftentimes not highlight, highlighted in our, uh, our, 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 our more uh, normalized or mainstream fare. And then connect the concept to spiders and the network that a web is, but also the nook, the nest, how we wanna stay connected to our neighbors, and see, all this alliteration that's coming out of me naturally becomes mnemonic. Now we're learning the material in ways that help us to help us to, to, to stick to it. And that we so when we when we when we have test anxiety or we're not sure, we feel imposter syndrome, we cannot lose that A, B, C, D, E, because there have been rhythms set up for us before we got there. I feel significant when you set up rhythms for me. It lets me know you took the time to prepare not only a classroom, but a learning space where you allowed me to jump into that double that you set up. And when you see me come in, you see my rhythm has changed, you adjust, you might speed up, you might slow down, but we're doing it together as neighbors who look out for each other. That's the culture in this classroom. So I like to get to your name because that helps me to get to the roots of who you are. And then when we get to the roots and we start speaking purpose into your life, we can forge new routes together, right? Professor ready is something that I, I share with my younger kids, but I oftentimes like to find ways to be creative and, and use names and poetry. So I, I refer to myself as Professor ready and I say the R is for the radiant rhymes and rhythms that I give. The E is for the effervescent energy and excellence with which I live. The A is for the awesome ability abounding in you and me. The D is for the darkness destroying dream developer that you see and the Y, well that's easy. The Y is for you, you, you and you. Making you ready motivates me. So that's a poem I wrote to connect to middle schoolers because they don't even like themselves. So I'm gonna let them know, Professor Reddy loves you. Or Uncle Sonny, as I refer to myself. Thank you, Michelle, I received that, thank you. Metabolizing the affirmation. Uh, I oftentimes will tell people, you can call me Dr. Kelly, you can call me Dr. Sonny, you can call me Uncle Sonny, you can call me Professor Reddy. Uh, just don't call me late for dinner. <laughs> but I will say this, especially because I'm in the South and we respect the rhythm of handles, I, I don't, I don't, allow students, when I say allow, I ask students not to call me Sonny because there's a certain level of reverence and honor that goes with a title, whether it's uncle. I want, I, there's, a, there's a level of connection. There's a level of connection that comes with the handle in the South. Now, in your different respective areas, you do what you will. I came from California. We called everybody, our friends, moms, everybody for my first name. It's something I've learned later in life. But even now, if I meet somebody who is older than me, if they're very older, if it's a female, I, I call them mother. If it's a male, I call them baba or father. Um, I always call them miss or mister. I try to put a handle on it because it's my way of showing reverence and relationship. So figure out what that rhythm is in your classroom. And instead of saying, this is what you will call me, ask them to call you that. 
model vulnerability, model uh, what it is to participate in rhythm setting. And then you make meaning matter. So I gave you an example when I talked about the white wave, right, of making meaning matter. Um, Shauna, I have a big brother. I, I believe you're younger than me based upon the picture that I see there. Um, it could be seen as a compliment or just stating facts. It is what it is. But I have a big brother who is my big, my, my older brother. And I, I'm prefacing with your age because he's my older brother. But if you were to say something in the classroom, Shauna, uh, for example, you were the one that the first one to get the book. I'm like, okay, okay, big sister move. I mean, my big brother, Sean. Okay, cool. I'm finding ways to connect my rhythm to yours and to always bring it back to meaning. Always bring it back to something relevant in the classroom. I can draw anything that you say back to the coursework, back to the material, because my job is like a Nazi to make a web between you and me and you and the other students and you and the material and really us and this community, this learning community, right? And if I want to be more relevant to today, I might say, Remember, I'm teaching you a lot of stuff, which gives you a lot of power. And what did Peter Parker learn, the famous Spider-Man? With great power comes great what? Does anybody remember? Responsibility. Come on. Responsibility? You, my big sister, my little big sister. Yes, <laughs> responsibility. Yes, I heard too. Who else? That was Shauna. Who else said? Who else said responsibility? I want to get credit where credit is due. Yes great responsibility. And so what I'm telling these students is not only am I here to teach and learn, but I'm here to empower you. Like when you get this information, you're about to be dangerous. And I'm going to challenge you. I want to make sure, big sister, white wave, Michelle, I think Michelle, well, I think of Michael, the archangel in the Bible, but also I think it, it has a Hebrew connection to like, there is none like God. Michelle, the unique, powerful one, right? Um, I, I think, my, well, Monica can mean many things, but I, I saw Monica meaning um, unique in, in one translation from the Monique from French, uh, like mono, like there's one, right? Mono, like monopoly, one person owns everything. So there's there's none like, come on, yes, praise hands, I'm with you. I love that, Monica. <laughs> so every time Monica answers something, I might say, Monica, that's a one-of-a-kind answer from a one-of-a-kind scholar. Thank you, sis. All right, let's keep going. You see how easy that is, y'all? But I just made this kid's day and... I made a connection with her, right? And so we find ways to actively do that with every student and you check yourself. Anytime you haven't made a connection with the student, you stop and you fix, figure out how to make a connection with them. Whether it's a special handshake, a special term, a special connection with their name and the material, whatever it may be. I have a student who uh, is a very kinesthetic learner. He, uh, he's challenged in some ways, but he loves to get on my class Zoom and be the first camera up and he's walking around playing with his action figures. He's, he's a man, he's in his twenties. He's playing with action figures. But I mean, I asked a question, he chimes in from across the room. Yeah, that's uh, interpersonal co co uh, competence. And he goes back to what he's doing. And every time he answers, I'm like, Logan, you are like the best kinesthetic learner I know. Logan, get it in, keep moving, yes. And I celebrate him in that moment and I go right back to my lesson plan. Took me a couple of seconds, but I'm weaving that web weaving that web, right? Honey, I, I'd like to ask a question. Please do, I love this, Shauna. So I work in higher ed, I'm an instructional designer, I'm not a professor. And mm -hmm. so I, but I work with professors helping them to, to upskill in, in some of these areas. And it's a STEM school. Yeah. And so a lot of times when I approach faculty with these ideas, I get a lot of pushback, a lot of resistance because it's so foreign to them. What would your advice be to, to get people more accustomed or warmed up to this idea about being vulnerable, about in, a, in an environment where that's sort of been pushed off to the side, not even on the back burner, kind of like pushed off to the side because it's too touchy-feely, it's not my responsibility. Right. You know, I think the, the first and most difficult thing to convince them of is that students learn better when they relate to you and to each other. And I know that many people in the STEM field, but ac across higher education, but especially in the STEM field, they value memorization and proficiency with the material, right? They, who cares if I like you? Can you, can you, do, can you complete this formula, right? Um, I, I wanna challenge them and say, your students will do well um, by memorizing, but your current stars will do even better by relating. And the ones who are failing and who are not connecting oftentimes are missing out on that excellence because they don't have relationship, whether it's imposter syndrome, whether there's some challenges in how they learn, whether they learn differently. So how about we close the gap and 
improve the success of the current students and help some students who are not succeeding succeed. And so what we do is we build relationship just to let them know that you care, that, 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 that they matter. At the end of the day, hopefully, one of the reasons why you got into this business was because you like to build up people and make people better and stronger and smarter. Now, you don't have to be all frou-frou and stuff with it. You just have to go in there knowing that you care. And I'm going to challenge you to do two things. Number one, learn your students' names and say them properly because that really matters. And number two, find a way to incorporate their names and their stories into your work. If it's math, it's just as simple as making word problems that include their names. We all have to make our quizzes and our tests, and we can easily just make up arbitrary names and connections. But if you're listening to your students and you know you have a student named Jamal, his mom's name is Tisha and she works at McDonald's and that's why he's late some days, you may say, uh, Jamal's mom, Letitia, uh, Tisha gets off at 5 p.m. Jamal has to catch a bus or whatever. You just make a connection. Never in a way that's calling people out, but just bringing in whatever they've shared openly. Uh, that's not going to be a point of shame, but rather just a point of recognition. And bring it into the word problem. Or you're talking about uh, the biology or the environment. And you, you, you bring in elements uh, of, of, of social justice and how toxicities and pollutions tend to be uh, pervasive, more pervasive in, in underrepresented communities. Some of those represented in this room right now. Let's connect it to action. What, what can we do about these things? Like students always ask, when am I ever gonna use this? So let's actively find ways to show them how they're gonna use it, right? I mean, that, that not only is job security for you, <laughs> but also it makes the learning process more fun and more engaging and interesting. So it takes extra work in your lesson planning, but why don't we put some meat on these bones and connect their names, their proclivities, their lives and life stories to the material at every turn, on the quizzes, in the discussion in class, et cetera. And the more you open up, the more you can add this poetry and all that stuff, but I get it if you're not comfortable with that. But guess what? Poetry is nothing but rhythm and rhyme and meter, which really is mathematical, right? Music is mathematical. Right. Uh, so all these all the rhythms and patterns of life, you know, I was a pharmaceutical sales rep for a, a little while, believe it or not. And I had to learn the ins and outs of anatomy and the, sim the systems, the asymptomatic and the symptomatic. And everything is a system in our bodies. The way blood flows, it never flows in the opposite direction. Right. If it does, you're in trouble. Right. Always flows to the right vessels and right valves and everything. Everything's sy systemic. That's poetic. That's poetry in motion. And if you can't acknowledge that, you're, you're missing out on some of the joy of what it is to learn this stuff and to teach it and really to relearn it, right? As teachers, we get to relearn this stuff and see new eyes open up to see stuff we never saw. And then hopefully they'll discover something we never knew before when we share these rhythms. So it sounds a bit lofty what I'm saying, but I think if you can just stress to them that students will do better when you can connect them to the material. Do that by connecting their names, their stories, and their interests. Find out what matters to them what they're going through, and then connect the material to that. If you're in math, measure what they're going through with, the, with that. Put numbers to it. If you're in the sciences, then find a way to connect how, and your science is relevant, that's why you're in the field, find a way to connect what's happening in their spaces and in our world to the sciences, whether it's in the reading or the discussions, et cetera. So I hope that that helps. And Shauna, of course, it'd be an ongoing conversation. And uh, I, I've worked with at Fayetteville Technical Community College, our team that is in uh, faculty development. And I know it feels like you're always against the tide because those of us who are professors, STEM or not, on communication, we push back because we have a way of doing things. I know what I'm doing in my classroom. I don't need my big sister come to tell me how to do it better, but I, I really do. I need your rhythm because you you studied this. You're an expert in this thing, right? I need to slow down, find out how to get your rhythm connected to my rhythm and we can all do better in the classroom, right? So thank you for bringing that point up. Thank you. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. And thank you for asking that question. This is, like I said, it's a smaller session. So we're we're gonna go back and forth. We're in our last 30 minutes here. So I am gonna open up, Shauna, thank you for your leadership, like a true big sister. Uh, thank you for your leadership. Um, that. If I may interrupt you, uh, yes. Sunny, that, that was Jen's question. Uh, oh, Jen thank you. you I Jen, please I want to take credit for her good question. That was not mine. <laughs> so Thanks, uh, Shana. great, great integrity. And see, and so what just happened right there, you see how relationship is built. Thank you, Shauna. Thank you. I'm receiving. We're, we, we're, we're receiving the flow back and forth. And because we have permission to talk, we have permission to say, my bad, let me correct. Thank you. And then I can apologize to Jen. Thank you for that wisdom. Yes, yes, yes. Um, <clears throat> and thank you again for bringing that wave of clarity to me. That's your theme today, Janice. Keep me on track. I appreciate you. Uh, one thing that I do at the top of classes is I stop and I say, I hear you. 
um, it's an exercise that I like. I try to find some exercise. And Jen, this will be good too for your, your STEM teachers that are trying to find a way to connect to their students, but it doesn't come naturally to the teacher or to the instructor or professor. There are some basic mechanisms that they can use that are not very time consuming, but can help them to get into the hearts and minds of their students. I hear you as a practice I use, where I start on the very first day of class, learning the students. The most important text that we can learn on the first day of class is the student. The syllabus will be there all semester long. Don't spend the whole semester going over the whole class, going over the syllabus and then let them off early. Don't let them off the hook. Don't let yourself off the hook. Use that time to learn them, learn their names, learn as much about their stories. You'd be a super sleuth because the more you know about them, the more effective webs you can cast, right? So I hear you as an exercise where I have everybody go around, say their name, what their name means that they know and how they're feeling that day. And it can be, I'm hungry, I'm tired, I'm bored. I'm just gonna ask you to show it in your body some way, shape or form. When they do that, they see, you know, my name is Sonny and uh, my name means little boy. And right now I'm feeling kind of, and everybody else will go, I hear you, Sonny. And what that does is it allows us to not take ourselves so seriously to share our modes of expression, auditory, visual, and kinesthetic, and to play with this notion of the fact that it's now become a part of our rhythm, that we're sharing rhythms, right? So basically, uh, let me just give a, a shout out to the chat here. Poetry is distilled meaning and emotion, yes. And it is distilled meaning and emotion in motion when you allow it to be embodied. Uh, Deborah says, thank you, I have to leave. Oh, okay, thank you, Deborah, for being with us. Thank you. Buzzing like a bee, go be busy, handle biz. Just take care of Deborah because we only get one of her, please. Um, so everybody in the classroom says, I hear you, Sonny, and they, and they do the motion not to make fun of them, not to do anything other than to say, I'm taking you in with my eyes, my ears, and my body. And I'm allowing myself in this space to learn through my body, my eyes, my ears, and everything else that's in here through you, right? Another thing I'll do is I'll ask for a rose and thorn. Like, hey, today's lecture didn't seem like it landed like I wanted to. Can somebody, can y'all help me out? We're gonna do rose and thorn. What was one rose, one great thing about today? One thing that you really enjoyed? I really loved your energy, cool, thank you. What was a thorn? You went way too fast. Okay, I'll be slowing down, thank you. Or you didn't put any visuals up, I couldn't take notes, right? This rose and thorn models vulnerability and constructive uh, criticism and receiving constructive criticism. It also gives you a chance to get to know them and find out what, what they're concerned about and, and incorporate them into this rhythm of the learning environment. Red, yellow, and green light is also a similar way of checking in for feedback with the students, saying, hey, your feedback matters. About mid-semester, I wanna ask you all, don't do it at the end of the semester because they can't benefit from that, right? Mid-semester. What's something I should stop doing altogether? Red light, just something you don't like me doing. I can't guarantee you that I'll stop because some stuff I have to do, but I will try to adjust and I will listen to you. All right, yellow light, what's something that you wish I did more of or you wish I did less of? And then green light, what's something that you're just loving? You're like, yeah, just do it all the time, it's great. Cool, you take notes, you study them. Your students are the most important texts that you will study and learning their rhythms allows you to be the excellent composer of this symphony in the classroom that you're called to be. Haiku. Haiku is a wonderful poetry form that I oftentimes use for students. Jen, to your point about the uh, STEM, you can do a haiku about anything. You can do a haiku about uh, the Pythagorean theorem. You can do a haiku about uh, the autonomic system in the body, right? It's basically a chance for you to distill everything you've learned into just three lines of poetry. Like what's the most important stuff? Not only is this helpful to process and metabolize the information, but it also can become mnemonic because now you're putting into a, a, a particular uh, numerical rhythm. You're putting it into, excuse me, ooh, I don't have it there, five, seven, five. So a haiku is five syllables, seven syllables, five syllables. Five syllables, seven syllables, five syllables. So I oftentimes, just to break the ice, I oftentimes will ask my students to write a haiku about their highest high. And it cannot be about a substance. You can't talk about how you had the best blunt. No, your highest high in life. It can be figurative. It can be literal if you're high in the sky, but not drugs. And what I asked them to do is just start writing freestyle, kind of in the, in the spirit of Brene Brown. She said, just write a, a, a silly first draft. She uses a different word, but it's a family show. But she said, just in, I think it's Rising Strong. Brene Brown talks about just, just, just flowing, just saying what you're thinking at the time, what you're feeling. And just as a backup to that, the famous Fred Rogers says, anything that is human is mentionable. If it's mentionable, it's manageable. So our, the method to our madness is getting students to talk about what they're feeling and what they're thinking, and then connecting that to the material to see what they feel and think about the material. 
Um, Jen, I remember one, one of my trigonometry teacher, I've never been a math guy, never, never enjoyed it. But my trigonometry teacher, Miss uh, Ka uh, Kawasaki uh, in 11th grade, she made us turn our uh, graph, we, we had to graph formulas and we, we were making parabolas and all kinds of stuff. She made us turn them into art. So like I turned mine into a clown and stuff. And somehow I'll always remember that project. Like it made me really enjoy that process. Like I was trying to make a specific formula to make a clown's nose and to do this. And she challenged me to get out of my comfort zone by flowing with my artistic comfort zone and making a connection, right? So I learned the material better because she allowed me to play. She allowed me to play. So a haiku allows you to play poetically. And so it'd be five syllables, seven syllables, five syllables. For me, as an example, whenever I share the haiku of highest high, I think of the, the birth of my firstborn son. And I say, just one tuft of hair, five syllables, from down there, pushing for love, seven syllables. I am his, he, mine. And for the better part of 26 hours, my wife was in labor. And once she dilated enough, I could just see his hair coming out of the cervix, out of the birth canal. And I remember the OBGYN was such a sweet, sweet, kind doctor. She, she would caress his hair and say, come on, come on, you can do it. Come on, you can do it. And for several hours, all I could see was that tuft of hair. And that was my son to me. All of my hope, all of my dreams, all of my prayers were invested in that little tuft of hair that was being caressed by this kind and sweet doctor and being pressed out by my courageous and bold uh, wife. And so I was overwhelmed by just love in that moment. And then when he came out, I looked at him and I realized my identity had shifted in a way that was indelible, um, immutable unchangeable, right? I will forever be Sterling Kelly's daddy. And Sterling Kelly will forever be Sonny Kelly's son. We could die, we could reject each other, we could move on with life, but you can't take that DNA from me. You can't take that title from me. I would never release it. So in that moment, I was his, he mine. It's huge. So my highest high connects to who I see myself as a husband, as a uh, father, as a person who cares about kids. Like, like this simple haiku, five, seven, five, three lines has a cornucopia of avenues through which you could connect to me and find out my rhythms and get me to listen in and lean in and try to hear what you have to say. It's a trick. I'm trying to figure out what's on your heart because when I know what's on your heart, you'll know what I, that I care. And nobody cares how much you know till they know how much you care. There's always a method to my madness, y'all. I'm kooky, I'm silly, I'm fast, but I'm always being repetitive. I'm always coming back around to what matters most here. Right. So these are multiple ways. And again, Jen, I know people, they like, especially STEM folks, they like to do it their own way and they like to have multiple permutations or formulas. Well, you can use any of these. I hear you, rose and thorn, red, yellow, green, haiku to tap in to your students' hearts and connect that to the material. So here's some key terms. I won't get into this because these are probably old by now because, you know, the kids change their language. When I say the kids, I mean college students. Um, I'm 45 years old and I, they don't, when I sing the cheer song, sometimes you wanna go, my students look at me like they, I'm an alien. So I'm, I need to just learn, I learn from them every day. Uh, so this is stuff I took maybe, probably two semesters ago and now it's passe, I'm sure. But they'll type this into the chat. I feel some type of way. Uh, when I do, I hear you virtually, for example, I feel some type of way. It means I'm upset, but I don't have words for it. In my feelings, it means I'm really dwelling on something that's that's heavy and and I'm 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 don't bother me today. I'm I'm in my feelings about something. Uh, that really hit me in the feels. It really um, it really tr triggered me. Uh, it could be in a positive or negative way, but it, it it broke my heart. I remember one of my students typed that into a chat back in the uh, pandemic times in 2020, and my 13 year old was doing school from home. And I muted myself. I said, son, what does it mean when somebody says, hit me in the feels? He's like, yeah, it means their heart's broken, dad. Cool, go back to class. So I'm constantly learning from them, right? And cap, no cap. Cap means, uh, you know, that's a lie or that's, that's crap, that's bad. So if someone says, yeah, I love, I love the Broncos. Cap, that means I hate the Broncos. I love my team. No cap means for real, for real. I'm being serious. I put that on my mama. I'm keeping it 100, right? No cap means I'm being for real. I'm not... I'm not sliding you or anyone else. I'm being as honest as I can. Uh, someone is doing the most. That's usually me. You're above and beyond um, in an annoying way. So I start, I start every class like this. So I'm at a 10 and students usually want to rein me into about an eight, but then they start loving me by the end. But if you're doing the most, you're, just, you're doing too much. Um, if you come for someone, be careful in your classroom. 
We talked yesterday about microaggressions. Uh, when someone says that someone is coming for them, that microaggression has now become a, a, a threat to the, to the community on a public level. That means that person feels like they have been invalidated or attacked in such a way that they cannot go on emotionally in a healthy way without addressing that. Like there's a problem in your classroom, stop teaching and adjust and make sure honor and respect and dignity prevail in that. And grace, of course, right? Um, so when someone says that, uh, she came from me or he came from me, stop and address that. Same thing for cap. Cap can be fun and flippant at first. Cap, no cap. But if you notice it going back and forth and it becomes like a, uh, there's some energy, some negative energy that rise up, stop, stop it and just say, okay, we're not doing that. Yeah, let's adjust. Let's do better. Let's do better, right? Uh, and again, instead of just saying we're not doing that or stop it, we ask, hey, can we do better? Let's do better. Let's show more respect for each other. Can we do that? We're using we language and collective community language. That's part of our rhythm. Uh, keeping it 100, keeping it 100% real or honest. I'm here for it. When you hear a student say, I'm here for it, yes, green light, press into that. That means they're happy. Or a student says, oh, I stand on that, I stand. Um, or if a student says, I got time for it today, or I got time for you today, that usually means I'm ready to fight with you. But it can be used in positive if you go into a topic and a student's like, oh, I got time for it today. That means that he or she or they are about to share because they have some stuff they want to share about this thing that's been on their heart or mind. And nice fit. Does anybody know what nice fit means? It doesn't mean that you fit in the classroom. This one threw me off and I, I, I had to regroup. Nice fit, has anybody heard that before? Uh, Jen, talk to us, what's nice fit mean? There are a couple of us in the chat. Oh, oh you're in the clothes, chat. <laughs> clothes yeah, and outfit. <laughs> You got it, Megan. Thank you, Megan. Thank you. Yes. Sure. So it's clothes in the outfit. So, so I, that outfit. So <laughs> is it credit where credit is due. I love it because we have a rhythm here where we give each other credit and we recognize each other. I love that. Um, thank you, Megan. Yes. And thanks for being the spokesperson as well. Um, Megan, by the way, uh, well, I'm going to say I know there's a name Morgan, which means a captain, a sea captain, captain of a ship. Um, but I, I've got to look up Megan. Megan, do you know what Megan means? Uh, I've looked it up before, but I cannot remember. <laughs> learn it, learn, learn it, you know, but I want you to learn it and live by it. Because when we walk in those classrooms, it can be so daunting and exhausting. We got to find purpose. Like my name means Sonny, it means little boy, right? I always thought that was diminutive and it is technically diminutive, right? But I always thought it was just not fitting of me, as, especially as a young man. But then when I grew up, I realized I have the energy of a little boy and I've found a way to harness that and to uh, not weaponize, but to actualize the meaning of my name. And I drive that purpose forward in my classrooms. And so I truly am Sonny or Uncle Sonny as it were, because I was named after a, a Man named Eli Mouton, whose nickname was Sonny. He was a happy drunk at all the parties. My father just loved him because he was just Mr. He was Uncle Sonny. So I am I embody that and I own it. So uh, and it gives me joy even on those days when I'm having a tough time and I'm tired. I haven't had my coffee, or whatever. I'm like, come on, Uncle Sonny, come on, come on, bring that energy of a little boy. And I speak to myself. Self talk is powerful. And if you practice it on yourself, it's going to be a lot easier to practice on your students. So uh, I, you made me think of a funny story. I have a student. She was super shy. My public speaking class. She she didn't ever want to speak. She wanted to be in the back of the classroom. And her name was Morgan. And we found out that the name Morgan means uh, uh, a, uh, a captain or a, 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 a person who's in charge in some kind of nav navigatory, navigational uh, field. And so every time I wrote her a song, every time I'd take role, I'd be like, all right, Morgan, you know, it's time for your song. And she'd be like, oh, my goodness. And she'd blush. But she'd, be, she'd sit there and listen. I, captain of the, uh, it was, it was a, um, uh, what I say? Um, captain of the ship. Queen of the sea, queen of the mighty ocean, or something silly like that. And I would do it every time. And I, I, I started a rhythm. I had to keep doing it, even when I didn't feel like it. And she loved it. And to the point where she was so bold at the end of class, I'm like, who is this kid? And a part of that was because she let me celebrate her. And it, it became part of our rhythm and, and our connection. And she felt safe. She felt celebrated and loved. So that was a really cool um, Thank you, Michelle. Are y'all laughing at me or with me? Anyway, uh, <laughs> oh, this is what I, I said, sovereign of the sea, captain of the ship, queen of the mighty ocean. How you doing today, Morgan? And she'd be like, I'm fine. Cool. I hear you. Next one. So here we go. Oh, there's my haiku uh, pattern. All right, so as you're telling stories to your students, this is another thing for STEM folks as well. You've got to put meat on the bones by telling stories to connect, whether it's your personal story of how, you know, you went through something where you needed to use this particular skill or a set of uh, information or bit of material 
to better understand what was happening to you or to survive or whatever the case may be, um, or some struggle you had when you were learning it and how you had to come up with a mnemonic device, whatever it is, you must have a destination in mind for your story. So have a punchline. Don't just tell a story to tell a story. It's a waste of your course time, right? But always have a punchline to your story. Include details, be vulnerable, include names, include how you felt about what was going on, uh, what you were going through, what you smelled, what you tasted, what you sensed. I mean, the best novels that we read are prefaced with all kinds of alliterative, uh, uh, illustrative uh, uh, details, right? Before you even meet the first character, it's like the dew dripped off the lush leaf, right? And you go, oh, I want to listen, right? People want to listen to details. And then there's drama. Let yourself get a little teary-eyed if you have to. Laugh. Let them laugh. And when they laugh, don't keep going with the story. Let them laugh and breathe, right? And let the drama take us on a journey because people all want to hear a story. That's why everybody's waiting to see King, uh, King James tonight on HBO Max or at the theaters, right, with Will Smith, right? That's gonna be a great story. I wanna see the drama of that. I can always watch a documentary about Serena and Venus, but this something about this movie is gonna take us, it's gonna make us spend thousands and ultimately billions of dollars across the globe, right? Um, so drama is important and it's helpful. Even for my STEM folks, you, you got stuff that makes you cry or upset or makes you happy, let your face smile, tell your face about it. Some of us walk around with RB, uh, 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 RBF, resting bully face, no, I'm a feminist, resting bully face, what I call that thing, right? And so sometimes you got to tell your face and, and feel the joy and let the joy be felt, right? Or the sorrow. Sometimes if you go to my website, sunnykelly.com, you'll see some of my storytelling. I talk about uh, racism and, 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 and different challenges that I've had in life. And, and sometimes it makes me cry and it's okay. And as a male in society, I, I, have to, I want to model that. Everybody should have permission to cry. If you're a female, you shouldn't be seen as hysterical if you cry. If you're a male, you shouldn't be seen as weak if you cry. There's power and vulnerability, right? Which leads me to dialogic. I've been dialogic this whole time. And that's part, thank you, Shauna. That's part of why our session is just kind of taking its time and we're going. And I have a certain way that I teach this, but it just depends on your energy and what you bring to me, the feedback you've shared. Every session is different. Every joke I ever tell will be different. Every song I sing will be different, especially just for you, because I'm being dialogic. I'm asking, I'm checking in, I'm seeing what people understand or know. I'm seeing that Jen has her hand up, holler at your boy. You there, Jen? Was that is that from before, or did you? I saw your your hand up. I just yeah, that was from before. Sorry, okay. but cool. Jana uh, posted a question in the chat. She said, Thank "Wait, you. what was the read me dirty or something like that?" Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Read me dirty is another one. If someone if someone says read me dirty, you need to stop class and adjust. Read me dirty means that you are imputing ill will to something that I've done. You are accusing me of something I did not do, and I feel hurt by it. I'm not going to tell you I feel hurt. I'm just going to tell you I'm mad. Or that you're trying to read me dirty and I, I take your mouth off of me. Take your mouth off me to don't talk. I don't want my name in your mouth. Don't talk about me. You're talking trash about me. And we're not, we're, I'm not going to have it. And if I say I have time for it today, I mean, this fight's about to happen in your class. So rewind it. Um, from read me dirty. Oh, stop. Let's, let's, let, let's read each other clean. And that sounds corny to say, but go ahead and say it. Just bring some comedy in the space. But yeah, read me dirty is a, it is a indication of a deep, um, a deep insult that has occurred in the classroom. And sometimes they may be talking about something outside the classroom and that's time to let's metabolize that let's talk about it and deal with how you feel before we go into the learning process if we can i mean we can't have a full therapy session but we can at least name it. again back to fred rogers whatever is human is mentionable if it's mentionable it's manageable oh so dialogic again always including each other checking in you're always iterative so you stay with your lesson plan and on your lesson plan, you're just taking each other along the way, always creating off paths for people to lose track or to, to kind of hit, take a note and, and, and forget and, and always creating on, on, uh, on ramps with redundancy and with connecting people and coming back and always welcoming questions, even if it's something we just covered. Great, I'm glad, let's go back to that. Let's make sure we get it right. This, is, uh, this, this, this CIA has saved my life at home and in the classroom. This, Interpersonal Needs Theory by William Schutz came out like he, he discovered it or established it as part of his uh, work with interpersonal and family communication back in the 1960s. And he discovered that if you want to see why relationships are going well or poorly in your classroom, you must become a CIA agent. That's a mnemonic device I use for my students. You must see where there is a lack of or a, uh, an abundance of control. Do your, feelings, do your students feel like they have no control in the classroom and you just tell them what to do? They're not going to be active, participatory co-learners with you. They need to feel like they have some sense of control. Red light, green light, yellow light, um, rose and thorn, those are ways to help them to have some sense of control in terms of how you're going to teach the class. 
multiple ways of them uh, presenting their work, not just a paper, you can do a video, you can come up and give a speech, you can draw a picture, finding ways for them to control the control how they are going to express their mastery of the material. And obviously you're in charge, but you can always give options, right? Inclusion, including them in conversations, including them in the, the why you're doing what you're doing. I've said this to you all several times today, and I say it to my students all on a regular basis. Let me tell you about the method to my madness. I always talk about the method to my madness. Not only is that a wonderful, just alliterative term that pops in a poet's mouth, but it also lets them know, I'm letting you in. I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna be like the Wizard of Oz and hide behind the curtain. I'm gonna open up the curtain and show you all the mechanisms and the machinations back here and let you know, sometimes I miss stuff up. Sometimes I need a white wave to come and remind me and pull me back on track, right? And that's okay, I'm including you because I need you, right? And I need you to understand why I'm doing what I'm doing. If you ever don't know, if you don't get the objectives, let's go back and review. Because sometimes I may even forget. I get ahead of myself, et cetera. So I'm including you in this process of learning. I'm also learning your name. I'm also singing your songs. I'm also bringing in your stories and examples. So I'm including elements of your rhythm into our class's rhythm wherever I can. Those are jewels, y'all. Everything you learn about a student is a jewel. And you never forget it. Take notes on it. It's worth it. And then finally, affection. I need you to know that I'm happy that you're here. So as we said earlier, when you come in, uh, when you come in a little bit late and you apologize, I say, you know what? Thanks for apologizing because I missed you. And I'll take you how I can get you. I always say that. When a student sends me an email, have you ever had a student at a college level send you an email with no, uh, no addressing, no, uh, what's the word, no cordial or courtesy, cour courteous, uh, 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 dear doctor, dear miss, dear whatever. Uh, they just go, hey, wh when's my paper due? You know, they just send you just the text of that, like they're texting their bud. And after I throw up in my mouth and breathe, and cuss them out my head. The first thing I type in is, hello, student, comma, space down, because I'm gonna model how you're supposed to do this. First of all, thank you for sending me a question. That is a great question. It's actually on the syllabus on page two. So I'll ask you to check that out. Let me know if you have any more questions after that. And in the future, just, you know, please tell me hello before you talk to me, because I, you know, I wanna connect to you. Thank you. Blessings, Dr. Sonny Kelly, PhD, he, him. That's how you do it. And my feelings have been hurt, yes, but I've also let them know, hey, in the future, I'd like you to do this. And they could, they could totally ignore it. And they could totally say, don't tell me how to write. That's cool. My feelings would be hurt when they say that. But guess what? I'm still going to be here loving you. And there's nothing you can do about it. And as I model that, love never fails. It somehow finds a way. When I show affection, even for those who, are, who, who deserve the least love, I, I think it was uh, the great coach from Notre Dame, uh, it was Lou Holtz, who said it, it is when people are the most lovable is when they need love the most. I paraphrase strongly, I've messed it up, but when people are at their most unlovable, when people are at their most unlovable is when they need love the most. So you wanna find ways to show affection to your students, especially when they're acting unlovable or unlovably. All my English uh, majors in the, in the room, please forgive me, I, I, that was an incorrect, use. it should be unlovably, that's the adverb. Uh, but also when I've been putting titles of books, I've been putting them in quotes. I know you're supposed to use uh, underlining or italics for titles of books, but I just, in the chat, I didn't know how to do that. So. Some of y'all might have been in chagrin. Uh, when you're going to discover, when you're going to discuss difficult things in your classroom, remember we talked about this unlovability. Uh, you've got to get to a place where you're talking about things that where you're going to disagree with each other. It's important that you follow three basic ground rules: respect, respect yourself enough to raise your hand and share, and respect other people's rights to share, even if you disagree or if you're offended by what they say. And we're not going to just leave it there. We're going to ask you to give them the benefit of the doubt. No doubt is rule number two or I call it grounding intention, a rule tends to feel like an external uh, imposition. So let's, it's an intention that we all wanna share in this room. Let's give each other the benefit of the doubt, assuming that most of us don't intend to hurt each other. But as we learned with microaggressions yesterday, your intentions don't always match your impact. So I'm gonna give you the benefit of the doubt and assuming that you didn't mean to hurt me, and I'm gonna share a counter perspective. And that leads me to number three. I'm gonna speak for myself and my counter perspective. I hear what you're saying. You're saying that most black men are, are, are criminals in your experience. In my experience, most black men are not criminals. I'm one and I'm not. And when you say that, it really hurts me. It makes me feel judged. So I'm speaking for myself, from my experience, not it, it, my dad, my life, me, my son, right? So I'm using, as we all learn in therapy, I statements, they're powerful, right? And they help us to navigate ways, uh, ways of through conflict without putting the onus on the other person or without calling the other person out, right? So those are three great grounding intentions when you're getting into a tough situation. Let's always show respect for ourselves and for others, give each other the benefit of the doubt, and honor ignorance. 
Do not call ignorance out, educate ignorance. Ignorance is an opportunity for education. Willful ignorance is a problem, we need to address that. But most of us are not willfully ignorant. Most of us just don't know yet, right? And we need to find a way in dealing with ignorance or dealing with things we disagree with to share our own perspective from our own experience without using generalizations, stereotypes, or absolutes. And we can all fall prey to that. So monitor your own language uh, to make sure that you're, you're, uh, you're honoring that. And I will say, this is my, my last point here. When you do share these stories with each other and you share stories that have detail and drama and dialogue, and of course, a destination beginning with the end in mind, Stephen Covey, you want to make sure that you prepare your heart and mind to openly receive that story. Reflect on the story. So when a person says to you, I had a woman in a training once say to me, listen, the term cotton picking is a uh, black woman. It's horrible. I hate it. My people were slaves. We were raped. And you say cotton picking like it's a joke. It's not okay. I hate that term. I don't want anybody else to hear it. I hear you. Um, thank you for sharing. That makes a lot of sense to me. I might, I might, um, I might frame it as well in, in my own perspective. Another woman across the room, middle-aged white woman says, when I hear the term cotton picking, I actually think of my heritage. I come from people that people would refer to as rednecks, which is a derogatory term that means a racist nowadays. But for us, it didn't mean racist. It meant we, we worked hard so hard that our necks were burnt in the back. We sacrificed. Our hands were bloody picking cotton. We were share farmers and tenant farmers. We weren't slaves. I just want to say, when I hear cotton picking, for me, it's a point of pride. For me and my family, she's following the intentions of speaking for herself, right? Which one is right? Which of those two ladies is right? Ding, ding, ding. Neither. They're both right. It's their truth. My job is to reflect on what they said to better understand it, to listen with my heart and my mind, to not try to put my own judgments on it or labels on it, just listen, and then ask clarifying questions. How many generations back? Wow, what was that like for you? So what did you, what kind of stories did your Mima and people tell you? What, <clears throat> what does it feel like for you when someone says cotton picking and they laugh it off? You feel silenced, you feel erased. Okay, thank you for sharing. I'm listening actively. I'm listening, uh, I'm engaged in my listening. I care, I'm listening mindfully. And then I connect the two. So what you're telling me is you both have two stories that are that are forged by pain and struggle in this country and you're proud of the people who survived those stories? That's what we have in common? Okay, I'm not making false equivalencies here, y'all. Tenant farming is not slavery. I get it, chattel slavery is evil. It's a whole different thing. I gotta find a way to make a connection though. If I don't make a connection, my web starts to break and now we're not feeling the net, the niche, the networking to the material in each other that we need to grow in this classroom. Then I can expand. So let, let's, let's do this going forward. Since we know that cotton picking means different things to different people, can we be careful about how we use it and make sure we don't say it in a flippant or silly way, but also make sure we don't cut somebody down and shut them down if they do use it because there may be a connection to their heritage as well. Can we do that? Buy-in, back to CIA, control, inclusion, affection. We can, good, because I'm happy when we're happy. If you like it, I love it. I used to have a boss who would say this to me all the time. He said, son, if you like it, I love it. And I felt that was so edifying to have my boss say that. Like my, my privilege, my, my preference mattered. So those are the kind of things I tell my students. I'll take you how I can get you. I love you. There's nothing you can do about it. If you like it, I love it. Like letting them know your preference matters to me. And I'm always going to listen to your story. I'm going to ask questions to clarify because I, I, I think you're worth my time to study. Then I'm going to connect it to my, my story, not making false equivalencies, but just making connections so we can expand and make new stories together. And I will close with this. This is a book that I read recently. Jonathan Sachs, he's a, a rabbi, a British rabbi. Um, and he, he said that the greatest single antidote to violence is conversation speaking our fears, listening to the fears of others, and in that sharing of vulnerabilities, discuss, discovering a genesis of hope. I don't know about you all, but the adults in this world and the folks who are out there uh, in the world are, are not doing great at connection and relationship. We're, we're doing pretty well at political correctness and popular cancellation and uh, violence and shutting each other down and memorizing our talking points and spewing and spitting them at each other, but not very well at connecting and building. And I'm not here to say that, you know, we can all just come kumbaya and that there, there are no differences that, that we can't overcome. Sure, there's some stuff that we're gonna have to agree to disagree on. There's some things that are, are, are uh, uh, essential in our differences. But in my, in my classroom, as for me in my classroom, we will love each other. We will respect each other. We will learn together. Not because I say so, but because I love you. There's nothing you can do about it. Two minutes for questions, comments, or concerns. I just want to tell you, you've made my day because I'm about to turn 52 and I heard you say you were 45 and you thought I was younger. So 
God bless you, sir. <laughs> Amen. Amen, baby face, Shauna. <laughs> My whole day is great now. Oh, I'm but glad. Your presentation would have made it great anyway. Thank you so and much. And that was not even intentional. I was just, just taking facts. <laughs> Monica, thank you for the celebration. I received it and I need it. Listen, I need celebration. I need to know my workshop went well and it mattered today. This is part of my purpose in life. Y'all are part of my purpose in life. I need you. Thank you. It so mattered. Uh, you know, this conference has been great, but your session today, so inspiring, so motivating to take back and, and share and share it with others. Thank oh, you so much. You're very welcome. This has been my favorite one of the whole conference. Um, this is my favorite. I love it. I love it. I love it. Thank you. I, um, I agree. And I was so upset that I missed the beginning because I accidentally went into the wrong conference uh -huh. for the first 40 minutes. And I realized I was like, oh no, this is not the one I signed up for. So I apologize for being late. But when I got in, I was like, I'm so upset I missed the beginning. So well, it was so wonderful, the part I did get to see. So thank you so much. And I'm sorry for my tardiness. Hey, listen, I receive your apology and I'll take you how I can get you. I'm so glad you made it, Megan. Uh, Barbara Cooper, our wonderful moderator, has been recording it. Thank you, Barbara, for reminding you. didn't even need a gin to remind you. Barbara, remember to uh, record it. And so this will be available later on. So I'm glad that uh, you want to see it because it will be available. Um, thanks. People are feeling recharged. I feel recharged, too. You know, when, when water doesn't flow back and forth, it stagnates and it becomes toxic. But when it flows back and forth, in other words, when I give you energy and you bounce it back to me, it makes me stronger as well. So it's not like I just came and gave you all a gift. You're giving me the gift of your presence, your affirmation, and the joy that you're sharing back with me. So I need that. And I thank you for that. We're flowing. We're flowing, y'all. There's a, a message in the chat from Christina that says, um, I think that means that Megan needs to hear the cheer song. Even though she <laughs> says she knows it, it's not the same as when you sing it. Oh, okay. <clears throat> the one that's uh, Sovereign of the Sea? Okay. Megan, the, I'm going to sing. Cheers, the cheers song. Oh, oh, oh! <clears throat> Making your way in the world today takes everything you got. Taking a break from all your worries sure would help a lot. Wouldn't you like to get away? Sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name. Dum, 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 dum. And they're always glad you came. Dum, dum, dum. You want to be where people see the troubles are all the same. You want to go where everybody knows your name. Do, 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 do. I was, was young, so that's, I don't know how I remember that. But. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you, Dr. Kelly. That was the perfect way to end the session. I tell you, I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. And I agree with the attendees. It was definitely one of our most inspiring sessions. So thank you for joining us. And when we host it again next year, we hope that you will come back and serve as a presenter next year. This was definitely well worth our time. And the information was fantastic. And I now feel just empowered, as I'm sure many of you do, in seeking opportunities and ways where I feel like I now have the tools and knowledge to personally connect better with those that I come in contact with and those I serve. So thank you again. Enjoyed it. You're so welcome. All right, so everyone. Well, you have about 10 minutes in between before your next session, if you're registered for the next session. And we're, we can go ahead and end unless someone had any urgent last minute things they wanted to share for Dr. Kelly. And if not- I have uh, oh, Pedagogy ahead. of the Oppressed on my bookshelf. I ordered it like a year ago and I've never read it. So now that is my homework. I feel inspired to read it now. Read it yesterday, Shauna. Read it yesterday. Yeah. I know. Well, you know how it is. You buy books and they just 